Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. I got your email, Elliot. I haven't had a chance to go back and look at what I said, but it sounds like it was not very clear at best. No, I mean it's. It, 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 I don't. I don't want to exaggerate, but when you say that the bet I numbers are unbounded, do you do you mean the value of the bet I numbers or the dimensions in which they appear? Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, um, the total number. Yeah, so, I mean, the betting numbers in each degree are finite. So it's the same to say they're infinitely many non-zero betting numbers. Okay, so if you look at CP infinity, for example. Right, it has infinitely unbounded. many, right, okay. unbounded betting numbers. Okay, okay, I, that's good. All right, is it time to start? I don't know what happened to um, the lecture on Wednesday, but it didn't get recorded. I remember hitting the record button, but when I went and looked at it, I had 34 seconds, so I don't know what happened. I apologize. <clears throat> so incentive to actually come to class. I came here to actually remind you to record. <laughs> Because I have yeah, to it, go a few minutes. It should be it should be recording now. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Leah. All right. Well, why don't we start? Uh, so today, I want to do more theory in infinite dimensions. So it's going to be more theory for um, complete Hilbert manifolds. Uh, well, Hilbert manifolds with a complete Ramanian metric. And there is an extra condition, which is crucial. It's called condition C. It was introduced by independently by Pale and Smail. It's now called the Pale Smail condition C. So uh, the first thing I'll do is a brief review of Hilbert manifolds. and a little bit about monarch manifolds. Very brief review. Uh, then I'll find good local coordinates. For non-degenerate critical points. And regular points. So that's a purely local description. It doesn't require condition C at all. Then I'll introduce condition C and show you how to use it to show that uh, if you have a Morse function and the inverse image of an interval has no critical points, then in fact, um, that inverse image is diffeomorphic to the level set at A across the interval AB. So you can integrate vector fields in infinite dimensions under condition C to prove this product result that we know in finite dimensions. <clears throat> and then just as what we did in just as uh, the way we proceeded in finite dimensions, I'll show that if F inverse of AB has a single critical point, that being non-degenerate and in the interior, then um, F inverse of AB, this interval, is homotopy equivalent or defor deformation retracts onto the bottom level, F inverse of A, union, an appropriate notion of the descending manifold. 
So this will be a ball in some Hilbert space, which might be finite or infinite dimensions, depending on the context. And you attach it along its boundary, which is a, a sphere in some Hilbert space. <clears throat> and then I'll talk about the homotopy theory in general. Uh, in general for these Morse functions out of sign condition C. All right, so a brief review of the context that we're gonna be working in, finding good local coordinates for both non-degenerate critical points and regular points, the purely local description. Then I'll introduce condition C and I'll prove these, what you might think of as semi-local theorems, the basic theorems of Morse theory, for what happens as you work in some band A, B. If there are no critical points, it's just a product. And if there's a single critical point, you add a handle to homotopy theory. And then we can pass from that description to homotopy theory in general. Okay, so our main interest will be Hilbert manifolds. So let me talk just a little bit about them. So we have some topological space. <clears throat> we have an open cover. We have a separable Hilbert space. Separable. Separable simply means there's a countable dense basis or equivalently a countable dense subset. And there really is up to isomorphism of Hilbert space, only one separable Hilbert space, namely little l2. So this is just sequences, x1, x2, sequences of real numbers such that the summation i equals one to infinity x i squared is, well, converges, converges absolutely. So that's little l2. There is an inner product between x and y, these being these infinite sequences. It's simply the sum of x i y i, i equals one to infinity. In Cauchy-Schwartz, shows that this is an absolutely convergent series uh, sum, summation because in fact it's less than or equal to summation x i squared summation y i squared to the one half that's cauchy schwartz okay so we get an inner product on the set of sequences uh, and you prove fairly easily by uniform convergence uh, that this, uh, the resulting uh, metric space is complete. And that's the separable Hilbert space. <clears throat> the countable basis is simply the unit vectors in each one of the coordinates. Okay. Just to compare, another example of a separable Hilbert space would be the L2 functions on the unit interval that vanish at the end, so let's see that. Yeah, I guess so, vanishing at the end points. <clears throat> Here the countable base is cosine two pi in T, if T is the variable, then sine two pi in T. That gives the countable basis <clears throat> of functions in L2. So this Hilbert space is isomorphic to little L2, sending these sines and cosines to the basis elements. Okay. All right, so that's help separable Hilbert spaces. So our our coordinates are gonna, our local coordinates are gonna lie in this separate 
separable Hilbert space. So for each alpha, we have a homeomorphism from our open set in X to an open set in the Hilbert space. And the overlap functions are required to be smooth functions of these open sets in the Hilbert space. So if you go from uh, phi beta of u alpha intersect u beta, which is in v beta, it's an open subset of v beta, and you go <clears throat> by phi alpha to, sorry, phi beta inverse phi alpha over to phi alpha of u alpha intersect u beta. That's in v alpha. This overlap function has to be C1 or CK or C infinity. So K, at least one here and up to infinity. So that's for all alpha and beta. And then these will be diffeomorphisms because the inverse is given by the other uh, going in the other direction. So just like we do in finite dimensions, the only difference is the open subsets or open subsets of Hilbert manifold. And what it means for a function to be differentiable is, so a function f from an open subset of a Hilbert space to the Hilbert space is differentiable if there's a bound for each x and v, there's a v alpha, there's a bounded linear operator uh, from the Hilbert space to itself a continuous or bounded linear operator. That would be differentiability at a point. And then C1 is simply that the function from V alpha to the Bonnach space of bounded linear maps from the Hilbert space to itself is continuous. That's what C1 means, continuous first derivative. And then you inductively define what the higher derivatives are. So for example, C2 would be the second derivative of F is a map from V alpha into the linear maps from the Hilbert space to the Bonnach space of linear maps from H to H. And this turns out to be symmetric in the two variables by the usual argument about, uh, I mean, at least if this is a C2 map, um, usual argument about um, partial derivatives commuting, okay? So we can talk about uh, CK Hilbert manifolds. They would be defined by a topological space, an open cover, and these local coordinates with CK overlap. And as usual, we do the same thing we do in finite dimensions. We associate to an atlas, the maximal atlas that generates of all compatible CK coordinate charts. And then the, the Hilbert manifold will be a topological space and a maximal atlas covering it of these CK overlap functions. Okay. So that's briefly what the Hilbert manifold is. If V is a Hilbert manifold, say CK plus one, where K is at least one, then we have the tangent bundle of V. It's another Hilbert manifold with a projection to V and the fibers pi inverse of a point X, uh, the tangent space X at V, and this is our separ separable Hilbert space again. It's really just the original H. And the way you see that is you work in local coordinates, V alpha, the tangent bundle of V alpha is simply V alpha across the Hilbert space. The tangent, uh, tangent vectors to, if you have an open subset of a Hilbert space and you take a tangent vector, just as in finite dimensions, it's identified with a point in the Hilbert space. You go from the affine space to the linear space. So the tangent bundle of V alpha is given by this product. And now the overlaps 
are CK isomorphisms if you start with a CK plus one structure. You lose one derivative when you calculate what happens in the tangent vectors because it involves the differential of the overlap function. So you lose a derivative. But anyway, this is a CK, CK Hilbert manifold. And this is a CK smooth projection. The fibers are Hilbert spaces. We could do, I mean, well, can do exactly the same thing for Bonac manifolds. I won't write it down. And the only reason to introduce Bonac manifolds is that these guys are Bonac manifolds in general. Here, the Bonac structure here is the norm of the operator, which is given by the supremum over V of norm one of the norm of LV called the norm of L. And that makes this thing into a Bonac space. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so as I said, the second derivative of a C2 function at a point X is a map from whatever open set, let's call it O. So O is in a Hilbert space, the open set into the continuous linear operators from the Hilbert space to the linear operators from the Hilbert space to R. Well, the linear operators from the Hilbert space to R, are not just a Bonnach space, they're actually a Hilbert space. It's the dual, which of course is identified with the Hilbert space, but nonetheless, let me write it as the dual right now. So the second derivative of F is a linear map from the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space, a continuous linear map. So, uh, but continuous linear maps like this, you can think of as symmetric bilinear forms, d squared x of f on v1, v2. So these are vectors in the Hilbert space is just dx, the second derivative of f, on V1, so you have a linear operator from the Hilbert space to the dual. This is an element in the Hilbert space, so the second derivative of it is an element in the dual of the Hilbert space. You can evaluate it on the second variable and you get a real number. So this is a map, a bilinear form from pairs of vectors into the real numbers and it satisfies that the norm of this thing on a pair of vectors is less than or equal to the norm of this operator times the product of the norms of the vectors. Okay. So if you have a yeah a C2 function you'll get an estimate like that. Okay, now a Ramanian structure. It's just a C K plus one varying smoothly varying family of complete positive definite inner products on the tangent spaces of it. And we'll often talk about co complete Ramanian metrics, but I won't introduce that. Now. The same same notion is in finite dimension. All right, let me just say that much of the usual differential topology in finite dimensions goes over. So you have the inverse and implicit functions function theorems hold for Bonnach manifolds and therefore for Hilbert manifolds. It's the usual argument. You do some Newtonian approximation using the uh, Bonnach norm and you find the inverse. So you just take the usual argument of the inverse function theorem. Of course, the chain rule holds. Um, you can integrate
um, C1 vector fields. Again, you do some sort of Newtonian approximation, just as in finite dimensions, to find the solution. And I'm not actually going to need it, I don't think, but Sarge there also holds. I'll just point out that these theorems hold for Bonnach manifolds and Hilbert manifolds. They do not hold for Frechet manifolds, things like the space of C infinity functions on a C infinity manifold is not a Bonnach space nor a Hilbert space. It's a Frechet space. And one of the big problems with using Frechet spaces is there's no inverse function there in general. You can, in certain contexts, prove an inverse function theorem, but there's no general inverse function theorem. That's why you tend to work with Bonnach or Hilbert manifolds. Okay. So that's the end of my introduction to Hilbert or Bonnach manifolds. Um, I will stop and ask if anybody wants to ask a question. If I think the question will lead us too far afield, I'll refuse to answer. But if you have a question, you can ask it. Anybody? Going, going, gone. All right. I hope that's a sufficient review for you. There are many nice introductions to this subject. So I won't say anything more. So here's the, our first theorem. First local theorem, what a non-degenerate critical point looks like. So O is an open set in our separable Hilbert space containing the origin. And F is a real valued C K plus two function. K always is greater than or equal to one. F of zero is zero, and zero is a critical value, meaning DF is at the origin, vanishes, and it's non-degenerate, meaning the quadratic function, quadratic form, the second derivative at the origin, um, as a map from H to H star is a bounded linear, continuous linear isomorphism. Bounded and continuous mean the same, right? Okay. So that's the condition of non-degenerate, that the Hessian, so this is saying the adjoint of the Hessian of F at the origin of F, which is a map from the space to its dual, is an isomorphism. And that's what that's saying. So that's a non-degeneracy condition. And then the conclusion is there exists an orthogonal projection P mapping this Hilbert space to itself such that sorry, I should say first I should have said there's a, a change of coordinates. So let me do that. Let me back up here and erase erase this. I'm going to say that, but let me say something else first. Then after a local change, C infinity of C K plus two change of coordinates, uh, F, so in these new coordinates, F uh, in coordinates, there is an orthogonal projection P mapping H to H such that F of V 
is equal to the norm of P of V squared minus the norm of one minus P of V squared. So I've reversed the positive and negative from where they usually write them. Usually I put the negative space first and then the positive space here. I have the positive space first and then the negative space. So let me try to explain what this is saying. So the change of coordinates, of course, some C K plus two change of coordinates, that won't surprise you. This orthogonal projection P, so we have the Hilbert space and we have a subspace, which we'll call H plus inside of H. This is a Hilbert, so it's a closed subspace. Closed meaning that it's closed in the topology. So it's, it's complete, the restriction of the inner product to H plus is complete. So in fact, then you can write H as H plus orthogonal complement, it's perpendicular space, which is gonna be H minus in a minute. The projection operator is to project onto H plus and then include H plus back into H. So in other words, you write H as H plus plus, as I just did, H plus complement, and you project onto the first factor. One minus P, and then e, then is easily seen to be projection, orthogonal projection onto H minus, which is by definition H plus perp. Okay. So this projection operator, this orthogonal projection operator splits the Hilbert space into something I'm calling H plus and this perpendicular complement H minus. This is the norm of norm square of the projection of the vector into the plus space. This is the norm square of the projection of the vector into the minus space and you take their difference. So this is like norm X squared minus norm Y squared in finite dimensions. Okay. So that's the claim. You have a, you have a non-degenerate critical point. F of zero is zero and the differential vanishes, but the critical point is non-degenerate in that this bilinear form or it's adjoint is a bounded linear isomorphism. Then you can change coordinates into the Hilbert space splits as an orthogonal sum of two Hilbert subspaces. And the value of the function is the norm of the projection onto the positive space minus the norm of the projection onto the negative space. Exactly, the, if you restrict this to finite dimensions, you will get the usual statement. Okay, the proof is really almost identical to the proof I gave in finite dimensions, except, except it has to be reformulated. So I never do this induction on coordinates. That's something you can't do in Hilbert space very often. So I have to do the argument globally, but it will follow along. So remember the first step in the finite dimensional argument was to write F of X1 up to XN equals summation X I J H I J of, sorry, X I X J H I J of X1 to X N. Hmm. Well, the way to think about this is that this is let H I J that matrix be an operator H X1 to X N mapping R in a bilinear form R in cross R in into R. And then this expression is just H I J of X one of, well, 
let me, instead of calling it x1 to xn, let me use x for the point. It's h of x, x, x. Because h of x is h i j x i x j. So if you take this linear transformation and you value, evaluate it on x x, you will get exactly this expression. So in infinite dimensions, step one is to show that there exists a symmetric bilinear form self well b of v defined for v close to the origin so that f of v is this bilinear form evaluated at point v that's a bilinear form you feed in the two the variables first and second variable both equal to v and you get f of b so b here is a map from this open neighborhood or maybe a slightly smaller one to um, linear maps from h to h star bounded linear maps okay well it's the same proof as in the finite dimensions, b of v is the integral from zero to one dt of the integral from zero to t of the second derivative of f at t v ds. Okay, so it's a double integral of these second derivatives. These are all symmetric bounded linear operators. You integrate over this um, triangle, you'll get a bounded linear operator. And this usual um, a Taylor theorem over the remainder, using the fact that the function in this first derivative vanish at the origin shows you that f of v is b of v applied to v v. So this I say is the analog of this expression in finite dimensions. Now, the next step I actually, I did two things in the next step, which combined both, uh, if you will, splitting this into a, a symmetric piece, as you'll see in just a minute, and taking square roots of things that came out, uh, these H11, for example. And I have to, in this case, in the infinite dimensional case, I have to split those two steps apart and do the symmetric step first, and then add in the square roots, which have to do with the eigenvalues. Okay, so now step two is that um, there exists a C infinity diffeomorphism defined in maybe a smaller neighborhood of the origin, uh, the C k plus two diffeo, such that f of v is a naught, I'll call it, psi of v, psi of v, where here a naught is the adjoint of this and it's an isomorphism since the um, this differential at the origin is non-trivial. So it's a linear bounded linear isomorphism. So the second is to take this quadratic form and split it as um, 
well, split it in this way. And then before I prove step two, let me just remark uh, that if we have this given psi, we change coordinates by the diffeomorphism psi inverse and get um, f of v equals a naught v v. So a naught is a self adjoint bounded linear isomorphism. So we're getting very close to what we want, but we're not quite there. We have to put in these square roots. So this is what I need to do. I need to split this quadratic form into, if you will, a product of an adjoint of psi with psi. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just quickly go over, how am I doing on the time? I'll just quickly go over the argument. And I won't give you any details here. So, so A naught is an isomorphism. That was a non-degeneracy condition. That implies that A of V is an isomorphism for all V. Well, I'll shrink this neighborhood. Uh, oh, I guess I'm calling it. I'll shrink this neighborhood anytime I need to, to a smaller neighborhood of the origin. So remember, A of V is the adjoint, is the adjoint of B of V. That's okay. so a map from the Hilbert space to its dual. These are all isomorphisms. So let's define a map B1 of V, which is B of V, oh, sorry, A. Uh, inverse of V A naught. So that's a linear isomorphism from the Hilbert space to its dual. And because these are self adjoint, the, the A's are, the A of V are self adjoint. We see that uh, A of V B1 of V equals B1 of V A of V star equals both of them equal A of zero. This one is obvious. If you multiply on the left by A of V, this expression, you'll get A naught. To see this one, you use the fact that these guys are self adjoint. So the adjoint of B1 is the adjoint of these two in the other order. And the adjoint of the inverse is the inverse of the adjoint. So that will cancel this factor. And you get the adjoint of A naught, which is A naught in the other multiplication. Okay. Now there exists a, well, B1 at the origin is the identity. That implies B1 at any V can be written as the identity plus B naught of V with B naught of V small uh, in norm, in operator norm. So that means there exists a square root, which is in fact given as a power series identity plus one half B naught of V minus one quarter B naught of V squared and so on. You just recursively solve this equation to get the square root. Um, you see, I've made the first two terms, the identity composed of the identity, the identity, here you get a half B naught, here you get a half B naught. So these two give me the identity plus B naught, which is what I want for the square, but then there's the leftover term, now there should be an eight, which is a quarter of B naught squared. So I subtract off an eighth B naught squared to cancel that. And you just keep going 
And because you're taking higher and higher powers of B and the norm of B is small, this is absolutely convergent series um, and gives you a continuous C of V, which is a map from our open set into bounded linear operators from H to H star and C of V squared is B1 of V. Okay, so you can take a square root of B1 continuously in V, you know, smoothly in V. All right. Okay, now Now, since we had these equations, A of V, B1 of V equaled B1 of V, A, uh, B1 star of V, A of V, because we had that equation. And because C is given by a power series in B, this equation also holds for C. So A of V, C of V, equals C of V star A of V. And that implies C of V star A of V, C of V is A of V, C of V squared, which is A of V, uh, A of V, B of V, which is A naught, okay? So C of V squared, A V, C of V is A naught, or C one of V, the star goes out there, star A naught, C one of V is A of V, where C one is the inverse of C naught of C. Okay. Replace it by its inverse and you get the opposite equation. Okay. So now let's look at F of V. F of V is A V V inner product V. A of V on V inner product V, which is C1 of V star A naught C1 of V on V, which is using the adjoint A naught of C1 of V, there's a V in here, V, C1 of V, V. So we simply let psi be the diffeomorphism C1 of V, V, and then F of V is A naught, self-adjoint linear operator, psi of V, psi of V. Okay. So that was what I claimed in step two. Um, if you didn't follow all these manipulations, and I know I went rather quickly over them, I, I wrote them up and they're on the web now. Okay, now a slightly tricky point. So at this point, we've got, we change coordinates by the inverse of psi and we get in the new coordinates, F of V is this A naught V V. And A naught's a self-adjoint isomorphism So we could, we could take the, we now know what the Hilbert spaces H plus and H minus are. H plus is the uh, linear subspace of V in H such that A, V, V, and that's how I, no. 
H plus is the maximal subspace on which A naught is positive definite and H minus is the maximal subspace on which A naught is negative definite. And the point is that this is self-adjoint and zero is not in the spectrum. So um, is A naught has no kernel. So suppose, let me, it's pretty clear that H plus intersect H minus is zero. You can't have a, a non-zero vector in the subspace where A naught is positive definite and also in the subspace where it's negative definite. So the intersection of these two spaces is zero. Let me show that their sum is everything. Well, if their sum is not everything, there'll be a vector in the, these are closed subspaces. That's the next thing to check. If you have a sequence of points in this maximal positive definite subspace, they converge to something. It's also in the positive definite subspace. So the sum of these two is a closed subspace of the Hilbert space. If you have a vector uh, W that's perpendicular to both of them, then A naught of W, W um, what do I want to say? I don't want to do that argument because I can't can't sort it out right now. So I claim without proof that H is H plus plus H minus. And A restricted to H plus or minus is positive or negative definite. So the last thing you have to do is arrange that the spectrum of A on H plus is plus one and the spectrum of A on H minus is minus one. So the way you do this is if you have any continuous function from the spectrum of a self-adjoint operator to the real numbers continuous, you can form G of A. It's a new self-adjoint operator bounded self-adjoint operator commutes with A. And in some sense, what it does is it multiplies an eigenspace of eigenvalue lambda by G of lambda. But of course, in general, these they're not eigenvalues. And so you have to worry about what happens when the spectrum has continuous pieces. Anyway, in this case, we take G of lambda to be the square root of lambda inverse, the positive square root of lambda inverse. And since zero is not in the spectrum of this operator A naught, G is continuous. And then you let G of A be T and you see that a t squared has spectrum plus one on h plus and minus one on h minus. That is to say it's the identity on h plus and it's minus the identity on h minus. So we now have f of tv equals a TV, TV, which is a T, T squared V, V. But a T squared 
is exactly projection onto the plus eigenspace minus projection onto the minus eigenspace. So we see that in these new coordinates, f of v is the norm of p plus of v squared minus the norm of p minus. And so that's the decomposition. All right, well, that's, I went rather quickly over that computation and I didn't really talk about how you do this operator calculus where you use continuous functions on the spectrum, but that's all fairly standard, uses the, what's called the spectral theorem. Anyway, um, we now have this decomposition near our critical point so we have O, we have F, we have our coordinates. Our Hilbert space is split now. And so we then can write any vector in O as V plus V minus, and this is norm V plus squared minus norm V minus squared. So we get the usual picture we're used to All right, it's now a sum of Hilbert spaces. Here's H minus, here's H plus here are the level sets and here are the gradient flow lines exactly as in the finite dimensional case everything works exactly the same way um, we have this d minus which is a ball in H minus, the descending manifold, we have D plus, which is a ball in H plus, the ascending manifold. And you can explicitly compute the gradient flow. The gradient of F is um, 2P plus minus 2P minus. And so you can calculate explicitly the gradient flow and you, you show that the flow lines uh, away from um, starting away from uh, the descending manifold do flow all the way from below the critical point to a level above the critical point. Mm -hmm. The same argument as in the finite dimensional case where I drew this two dimensional picture and I had my flow line at, at here. This region R, let's call it R bar in the plane. So R bar deformation retracts onto um, D minus bar, which is here, um, union F of A, some value below the critical point, intersected with R bar. Okay, so you have this deformation retraction in the plane of this area, which out on the boundary is the negative of the flow of the vector field. Okay, well, that lifts to a deformation of a neighborhood R, which is just the pre-image of R bar up in this sum of Hilbert spaces, to the descending manifold, which is this intersection uh, of the region R with the negative Hilbert space, that's D minus, union F inverse of A intersect this region. Okay. So a deformation retraction, just as in finite dimensions, of this whole neighborhood bounded on the sides by the green, this whole neighborhood down onto D minus union, the lower uh, level set. Okay. 
uh, just exactly as in finite dimensions. So once you have this splitting in the Hilbert space. Okay. So that's the local model for a critical point. A local model for for a regular point is easy. So if we have uh, x is regular, df of x is not equal to zero. Let's to simplify notation. Let's suppose f of x equals zero. We take coordinates. V centered at X so that local coordinates so that X corresponds to the origin in V. Okay. And then DF at X or the origin is a linear map from the Hilbert space to R a bounded linear map. And of course, it's not equal to zero. It's a non-trivial map because this is a regular value, a regular point. So let's call this L. And let's let W inside the Hilbert space be the co-dimension one subspace, uh, the kernel of L. Okay, so in my Hilbert space, I have a co-dimension one subspace and this function, linear functional L, and this is the kernel of L. And now choose a vector Y, such that L of Y is one. And let's define a map from W cross, uh, I guess I wanna go from the Hilbert space, from the Hilbert space to W, a linear map, linear isomorphism, it's gonna be in the Hilbert space, the W cross R, I send V into, well, I need to get something in the kernel. So let's take V minus L of V times Y. If you apply L to this, this is just a constant. So L of this will be L of V minus L of V times L of Y, but L of Y is one. So this is in the kernel. And then I guess uh, L of V. So this is in the kernel. And this is, of course, a real number. Okay. Direct computation shows this is a local diffeomorphism. So the local inverse, W cross R, defined in some neighborhood of the origin, into the Hilbert space has the property that if you follow, if you take this inverse isomorphism, call this psi, call this psi inverse, followed by F into R, this is simply a projection onto the second factor. So using the coordinates here, uh, F becomes, so F equals L in some neighborhood of this point. So there's a non-zero linear functional, which is in fact the differential of F at the point and coordinates so that F is equal to that linear functional. So we have coordinates and F is just projection on, is just this linear functional in these coordinates. Okay. Um, completely standard, nothing tricky about that. All right, so now I have local models. It's time to introduce condition C and uh, talk about the more global theorems of controlling the nature of uh, regions where there are no or one non-degenerate critical point. So condition C, Pallet condition, Pallet smale condition C. So again, we have a Ramanian, complete Ramanian Hilbert manifold, V, and a CK plus two function on it. It's said to satisfy 
condition C if for any subset S in V with F of S bounded, that really means above and below. So S goes, S goes into some bounded region of the real numbers under S. So F is bounded on S and the norm of the gradient of F over S is not bounded away from zero. So those are the hypotheses. So condition C says, if you have a subset on which the function is bounded and the gradient, norm of the gradient is not bounded away from zero, then the closure of S in the Hilbert manifold contains a critical point. Okay. So this is saying, if you work in a space where the function is bound, in a region of the space where the function is bounded, if you can get closer and closer to solving the equation df equals zero, then in fact, you can solve that equation somewhere in the closure of your set. So it says better and better almost solutions converge to a solution in a region where the function is bounded. <clears throat> so equivalently, you could say, you say if you have a sequence Xn in V and F of Xn is bounded uniformly on the sequence and the norm of the gradient of x in converges to zero as n goes to infinity, then there exists a subsequence x in k converging to a critical point. Okay. So better and better solutions <clears throat> and a region where the function is bounded, better and better approximations to the critical point actually have a subsequence converging to a critical point. Now, if you're working in a compact space, if V were a compact manifold, um, this would all be clear. Condition C is automatic. Well, the boundedness is for free. And then you can take subsequences. The norm of the gradient is continuous, so it would to zero. Here we don't have local compactness or any kind of compactness, so you can't take a priori subsequences that converge anyway. So this is a highly non-trivial statement about solutions to this differential equation gradient f equals zero or critical points of the function. All right. So that's condition C. So now let's consider Suppose we have A less than B, and these are finite. Okay. And F inverse of AB contains no critical point. Mm -hmm. Then, so this is a proposition then F inverse of AB is diffeomorphic to F inverse of A, the bottom level, cross AB in such a way that F is projection onto the second coordinate. Under this diffeomorphism, F becomes projection under the second coordinate. So the beginning of this is the condition C implies gradient of F of X in this region is bounded away from zero. Okay. Exactly in the 
set up where we can apply condition C. F is bounded on, let's call this region WAB. And I'll use WA for its bottom and WB for its top. So the first thing to notice, okay, so why is the gradient bounded away from zero? Well, we're in a region where F is bounded by definition or construction. So if the gradient is on this region is not, normally the gradient is not bounded away from zero, we're exactly in, um, in the hypothesis of con uh, condition C, which says that in the closure of this set, which is already closed, there is a critical point. But we have no critical point in this set by hypothesis. So in fact, the gradient is bounded away from zero. Okay. Uh, maybe I should just remark the two boundaries are smooth, whatever, CK plus one, CK plus two, smooth co-dimension one sub-manifolds because F is regular everywhere along the boundary. And so by the implicit function theorem, you see these, um, well, you can make these coordinate charts like we talked about a minute ago, local coordinate charts where this is the vanishing of a non-zero linear functional. And of course, they are the boundary of this Hilbert manifold with boundary. Okay. Now, okay, so now I want to claim, so the basic point to show here is that every flow line, CX for the gradient flow goes from WA to WB. So here I'm using CX is a flow line whose value at the at zero is X. So it's a flow line uh, initiated to start at X, a flow line for the gradient flow. Okay. Well, we got to prove this. We don't have compactness working for us now. All right. So let's look at a. So if you have a flow line in WA, what can have WAB? What can happen? Well, it can go off w, WB, that's one possibility, or it might run off to infinity, or it might just keep circling around inside here. Just a priori, those are the three possibilities. In this possibility, you go off the plus region. In this possibility, the solution may only be defined for finite time, but it goes all the way out to infinity. Here, the solution is defined for all time, but never reaches WB. Okay. Well, I claim that the length, so suppose CX on zero T plus lies in WAB. So X is a point in WAB, and we start this flow and suppose that it remains in WAB out to time T plus. Well, the first thing we know is that T plus is less than or equal to F of B minus, I'm sorry, is less than or equal to B minus A. Times uh, epsilon to the minus two. Because if I consider F of X C X of T and I differentiate it with respect to T by the chain rule, I simply get the norm gradient F at C X CX T squared, which is greater than or equal to epsilon squared. So if I look at F along a flow line, it's always increasing, at least at this spe speed, epsilon squared. 
Well, the total change in F is at most B minus A. So the upper time limit can't be any bigger than this uniform bound. Okay, so in fact, this picture that I drew of a, uh, a circling curve that goes on and on forever can't happen. The curves are only defined up to some, they can't be defined past this time, either because they go off the boundary before that time or because the length becomes infinite before that time. So now let's consider the length of Cx on zero t. Well, we have Cauchy-Schwartz, which tells us, so this is the integral from zero to t of the L1 norm. And that's by Cauchy-Schwartz less than or equal to the square root of T times F C X at, sorry, this should, I've got too many T's here, right? I do this all the time. C S D S up to T. F at C of T minus F at C of zero. So Koshu Schwartz says this integral from zero to T of the L1 norm is less than or equal to the square root of the length, the time interval, square root of T times the L2 norm. But the L2 norm integrates to give the difference in the values. Anyway, so this is less than or equal to square root of T again, B minus A. So T is bounded by B minus A over epsilon squared. And so this whole thing is bounded by B minus A over epsilon. So any curve for any amount of time that remains in this area has length at most B minus A over epsilon. Well, so we've ruled out the other two possibilities. Any, there's no curve in here of infinite length and therefore every curve in here has to hit WB at some finite time. So the, I'm, I'm now proved that the flows beginning at any point in, in, in this region hit WB in some finite time that you can estimate from above. The same thing happens. So just reverse the argument reverse and do this for minus gradient of F and A. So every flow line backwards for the same, by the same argument, reaches WA in finite time. So every flow line goes from WA to WB. And now you define a diffeomorphism WA cross AB into W sub AB by sending Y in here and T to the point on the flow line beginning at Y where F takes value T. And the standard argument, which we did in finite dimensions, shows that this is a diffeomorphism. It's clearly 1-1, one, one, it's clearly on to, it's clearly a smooth map, and you do a local computation of the differential to see it's a local diffeomorphism. Okay. So that's the case of no critical points. Now, if you have a single critical point here, well, you take a region, you take a, so this is B, this is A, this is gonna be the critical point plus some small amount. And this is gonna be the critical point minus some small amount. Here, this region is a product by what we just did. And this region is a product, just using the flow lines to contract it. 
this region I showed the region F inverse of C plus epsilon, uh, sorry, C minus epsilon, C plus epsilon retracts onto D minus, that's what this is, union F inverse C, C minus epsilon. So now you flow that further down and you see the descending, you see that this whole region contracts onto the descending manifold down to level A. So you get a deformation retraction of AB onto the descending manifold down to level A, union F inverse of A. So F inverse of AB, is homotopy equivalent to F inverse of A union, this handle, which is in the negative Hilbert space. You might ask, well, what's the change in homotopy type? How is, what, what change have you made in the homotopy type as you pass this critical point? Well, if, if the dimension of H minus is finite, we have a, ordinary handle. Finite dimensional handle of dimension equal to this dimension of H minus. If dimension H minus is infinite, so if this is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then D minus and S minus are contractible. And we have made no change. In the homotopy type. As we cross this handle. So the result is now you put all the critical points together. If F satisfies condition C and F is bounded above, uh, bounded below. So F is a map from this Romanian Hilbert manifold to R, it has to satisfy condition C, it has to be bounded below. Then V is homotopy equivalent to a CW complex with one uh, satisfies condition C and all critical points are non-degenerate. Then V is homotopy equivalent to a CW complex with one cell for each critical point a finite index the dimension of the cell equals the index of the critical point okay so the point is since f is bounded below you start with uh, a region where f is empty and you build up from that each time adding each time you pass a critical point, you add a cell, it's either a finite dimensional cell and you make the usual sort of homotopy change or it's an infinite dimensional cell and that doesn't change the homotopy. Okay. So next time I will apply this to the pass space uh, on a finite dimensional smooth manifold paths from P to Q where P and Q are not, are not conjugate points. So in that context, all the critical points will be non-degenerate. We have to show, well, anyway, we have to study the, the analysis of, of the energy function along this loop space. Show the dissatisfied condition C, analyze the critical points, show they're the geodesics, and show the index is given by these Jacobi fields. So I'll do all that next time but we will be applying this theory 
and we'll get a homotopy type for the loop space in terms of the critical points of this non-degenerate Morse function. Anyway, questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so how much of this theory goes through for Banach manifolds? Well, you don't have these. What was crucial about the Hilbert condition was that we had this splitting into two subspaces. Right. So in a Banach manifold, you don't have these projection operators. So you're missing that ingredient. You really need Hilbert manifolds for that. So you really can't get off the ground. I mean, the what it looks like near a regular value. Okay, that uh, that works. Um, that's just the inverse function theorem. But this splitting, um, you can't do in the bottom context. Splitting around a non-degenerate critical point. Uh, and is that is there any other place? I mean, if we assume some critical point has like this decomposition by closed subspaces, is there any other place where we use the inner product? I'm sorry, is there any other? Could you repeat? Yeah, is there any other point where we used uh, the Hilbert space condition from like uh, this decomposition? Well, I need, a, I need a Ramanian metric and the Ramanian metric. Ah, uh, yeah, okay forces the tangent spaces to be Hilbert spaces. Right. Yeah. So, and I mean, this all the stuff about the integral curves, I need completeness because, you know, I could take, take a Hilbert manifold, complete Hilbert manifold in a region A, B and take a point out of it. It's still a Hilbert manifold because it's an open subset of the one I had before. I haven't changed the, anything about the functions or the critical points or the norms of anything, but you can't integrate these flow lines because there'll be a flow line of finite length that can't be extended. Mm -hmm. So you need complete manifolds to know that a flow line either extends to infinite length or goes off the boundary. So I need completeness for that. So yeah, I think, I mean, the whole setup is Hilbert manifolds, Hilbert tangent spaces, but even this local theorem requires the, the Hilbert space structure. Now, how much of this would work if we did not use separable Hilbert spaces? I don't know. Must admit, I'm not a real expert in non-separable Hilbert spaces. I'm not even sure the um, spectral theorem holds. I mean, maybe it does. It's just not something I know anything about. So, um, I mean, maybe this all will work for a more general Hilbert manifold where it doesn't have to be based on separable, but I don't actually know. All right. Um, so we'll do the loop space on Wednesday. <laughs>